Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Reutemann, thank you so much for uh, taking your time to spend this evening with us. Well, Niam, thank you so much for this kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you coming to join me. So let me share my screen to make sure um, we have the right things going. Okay, from the beginning. Okay, do we see the right screen? Yes, Okay. just your slides. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about ABCs of management of advanced liver disease, and we'll talk about present and future. And uh, generally, um, my service gets called when your liver has uh, issues. So really, this is a massive, massive topic. So I have um, kind of three um, agenda items or three um, aspirational goals that I um, want to accomplish during this talk. One is uh, I really want to share with you kind of my daily approach to evaluation and management of advanced liver disease. Two, um, I'm hoping to provide you a framework which you can use to teach your trainees, your residents and medical students and fellows when uh, um, you are in attending about management of advanced liver disease. And three, I want to provide a few ticklers in terms of uh, where are we going? Where does the future um, leads us? So we'll jump right in. So this is the slide that uh, I actually pulled out from my lecture um, of about 10 years ago. So what is cirrhosis? Cirrhosis is uh, a late stage of progressive uh, liver scarring that is characterized by distortion of hepatic architecture and formation of regenerative nodules. So this was a very mechanistic understanding of cirrhosis. And uh, uh, I'll show you in the next slide that we have moved far, far past that mechanistic uh, understanding in the last 10 years. The other reason I put up the slide that is very, very old, admittedly, is um, uh, these guys that are holding their martini glasses. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the patients who end up in my office, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, Dr. Reitman, I never drank alcohol. How could I develop cirrhosis? So this is a reminder you know, to myself and to you guys to always reassure the patients that there's so many reasons that we can develop cirrhosis or advanced liver disease and that, you know, we believe them that they're not um, uh, drinkers. So that a lot of patients find that very reassuring. So what is the new theory of development of cirrhosis? So here we are, we have cirrhosis. Cirrhosis leads to portal hypertension. Porter hypertension leads to bacterial translocation. And bacterial translocation uh, leads to the expression of something called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or affectionately known as PAMs. So PAMs lead to the activation of the innate immune system. And the innate immune system uh, causes eventually the release of pro-inflammatory uh, molecules such as uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. So all of that um, leads to the splenic arterial vessel dilation and cardiovascular dysfunction, and then lead in turn to the uh, development of encephalopathy, kidney dysfunction, and hepatopulmonary syndrome. On the other hand here, uh, cirrhosis or also leads to liver injury. So the liver injury uh, leads to the expression of something called uh, damage-associated molecular patterns, or DAMs. And DAMs, in turn, also activate the innate pattern uh, of uh, recognition, and that goes down into the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species and all of that um, complications down below. So the reason I'm sharing this uh, uh, relatively complex diagram with you is uh, I'm hoping that we can harness this renewed understanding of cirrhosis uh, into eventually prevention and treatment. And we'll talk throughout the lecture about how to do it. So current strategies of management of uh, advanced liver disease is largely reactive, right? We develop ascites because, uh, you know, our bodies are hanging on to too much sodium. So let's get rid of the extra sodium. Hepatic encephalopathy, we have too much metabolite accumulation. So let's make the patient poop them out, right? Uh, volume problems. So, you know, we are going to replace the volume after large volume paracentesis or, um, uh, during an uh, um, episode of SBP. And intestinal dysbiosis, we manage somewhat um, 
successfully. We'll talk about it later. But the question is, is there a better way to address these complications through our improved understanding of pathophysiology? And we'll go through that. So future strategies might include uh, targeted, uh, targeting microbiome abnormality, so bacterial translocation. So potentially doing something to prevent the expression of um, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And certainly rifaximin has, uh, is being extensively studied, you know, not only for management of vertebratic encephalopathy, but ideally, uh, you know, much earlier in disease state to, again, address uh, the bacterial translocation and its consequences. We can look at the improved, improving disturbed circulatory function. We all know that our patients with cirrhosis are having low blood pressure, they're in, in, um, at risk for kidney injury. So what if uh, we try to fix it by long-term albumin administration? Uh, we'll talk about that later in the talk. We uh, can consider addressing an inflammatory state that these patients are um, chron uh, chronically in. Certainly, there's a lot of work that has been done about statins. And uh, last but not least is targeting portal hypertension, but not the way we're targeting right now, not waiting for the patient to have uh, an index uh, variceal bleed and after that jumping into it, but perhaps uh, jumping in a lot earlier and starting with the beta blockers a lot earlier. We'll talk about that again in, uh, coming up. So decompensated cirrhosis is defined by having ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, jaundice, or variceal hemorrhage. Uh, there's a multitude of additional com complications, but the one I want to highlight here is the hepatorenal syndrome. And hepatorenal syndrome, there's more and more argument to actually include it into the primary complications of the cirrhosis. So instead of four, we now have five. So now back, uh, we're going to jump into the, um, the crux of the matter. So the ABCs of cirrhosis management. So A stands for ascites, and I throw the renal dysfunction in, the, in, uh, in that category. B stands for bleeding and breathing. C for cancer and circulation. D for diuretics. E for encephalopathy. F is for fun. And I did not mean that flippantly, but I really, this was the letter that came out in the alphabet, and uh, I do uh, mean it with utmost respect. G is for goals of care. Um, and H is for holding inappropriate medications. So we'll spend more or less time on each of those um, letters. So first is ascites. As you know, this is the most common complication of cirrhosis. It only occurs when portal hypertension is, um, 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 has developed. It occurs in greater than half of patients with compensated cirrhosis within a 10-year period. But what is striking here is once the cirrhosis develops, there's a 50% mortality rate within three years without a transplant. So this is really worse than most cancers these days. So the, the, you, when your patient with cirrhosis develops ascites, it's really a sign for you to sit up, to sit up and reconsider where are we going? Is this patient a, a transplant candidate or do I really need to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion about goals of care? So there are four Ds of ascites management, diagnose, diuresis, drain, and defend. Okay, we're going to first start with the diagnose. So all new onset ascites should be sampled. Even though you're pretty sure that this ascites is due to portal hypertension, you know, uh, you'll be surprised. I've definitely um, had a patient with cirrhosis uh, develop um, uh, pancreatic cancer and have malignant ascites. I've been fooled many times by nephrogenic ascites, cardio, uh, cardiac ascites. So sampling and studying the ascites is a must. So we're going to look at cell count, gram stain and culture, albumin, protein, and cytology. And I have highlighted the protein because uh, probably the most frequent uh, ascites that we see that is not portal hypertensive is uh, um, cardiac ascites. And when we stop for a second and we think about um, the um, anatomy of the liver. You remember that liver is composed of the sinusoids. And um, in cirrhosis, the sinusoids are getting scarred up. So the protein from the systemic circulation um, cannot get into the acidic fluid. So in the portal hypertensive ascites, you have a low protein ascites. In the cardiac ascites, there's nothing wrong intrinsically with the liver. So the protein can easily get out into the acidic fluid and you have high protein ascites. 
So instead of memorizing the tables, you know, once you understand the pathophysiology of it, it's a lot easier to navigate that space. SOG, you all know about it. I will not spend much time on it. Um, and uh, other things to consider, depending on a clinical scenario, is uh, amylase, if, amylase if you're suspecting pancreatic disease or a variety of tuberculosis studies if you're suspecting TB, which is very common in my population. Next D of the ascites management is diuresis. okay? First of all, let's talk about salt restriction because everything should start with the salt restriction. And I know you're thinking these numbers are crazy. Like seriously, like what is she doing putting up these numbers? Everybody should be less than two grams of sodium diet. Well, I want to assure you that I'm not crazy and I did not come up with those numbers. They actually come from the most recent set of easel guidelines on management of uh, cirrhosis. And basically what uh, we realized and we've really known for a long time is uh, uh, patients on very, very low sodium diet uh, have um, a higher risk of di diuresis related complications. And most importantly, they actually stop eating. And those of you who care for patients with cirrhosis know that uh, calorie and protein malnutrition is one of our biggest enemies. So if you put your patients on two gram of sodium diet, they will stop eating. So this is um, not ideal. So next, uh, uh, remembering that hypoaldosteronism is really the problem. This is the reason the patient develop ascites. So we're going to focus on aldosterone antagonism with spironolactone. The starting dose is 100 milligrams daily. This is not your cardiology dose. 25 milligrams is a homeopathic dose um, in the world of hepatology. We can titrate pretty aggressively. Uh, prior to this current set of guidelines that I'll refer a thousand times during this lecture, is that we titrated by um, uh, 50 milligrams of uh, spironolactone every week. Now we learned that we can titrate every three days more aggressively. Max dose is 400 milligrams daily. I will admit to you freely that I've never gotten anybody to 400 milligrams daily without uh, have developing complications with their renal function of hyperkalemia, but I've certainly managed patients pretty successfully on 200, 250, and sometimes 300 milligrams of spironolactone. Uh, let's see, the ferrosamide, I'll say this now and I'll say it again, the 100 of spironolactone and the 40 of Lasix um, ratio is a myth. I challenge you all to find the data that supports the 100 to 40 ratio. So we're just going to think from the, again, from the pathophysiology. If our primary problem is with ascites, let's use the spironolactone. We should add the ferrosamide if we're treating uh, patients with anasarca, patients with hepatic hydrothorax, or if you're really dealing with long-standing recurrent ascites. Overall goal is minimal or no use of diuretics as ascites improves the results. Your patients have stopped drinking, you've treated their hepatitis C, you got their hepatitis B under control. Please go ahead and decrease the diuretics so we do not continue to stress out their kidneys. Next D is the drain. So treatment draining or para large volume paracentesis is a treatment of choice for large ascites. Uh, if your patient comes in and they look like they're eight months pregnant, Diuretics is not the right answer. Um, drainage is uh, safer than diuretics in this situation, less electrolyte disturbances, less encephalopathy, and less renal impairment. We want to be aware of the possibility of post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, where you've drained eight liters of fluid from the belly. Uh, all of the fluid from the systemic circulation is going to rush to fill that void. Your patient is going to become hypotensive and potentially develop acute kidney injury. To prevent that, we give albumin 25%. And uh, since in our world, rarely do we manage uh, paracentesis uh, ourselves, we really have somebody else do it. So it's hard to predict how much the uh, radiologist or the nurse practitioner in the radiology world is going to remove of the ascites fluid. So I usually write a blank prescription for 50 grams of 25% of albumin, and that covers most cases. A, one thing to consider um, in care of selected patients with low MELD scores, uh, not a lot of, not a lot of uh, uh, sarcopenia and ideally without underlying hepatic encephalopathy is TIPS. We are very comfortable with TIPS for acute varicell bleeding and sometimes we forget that is very, very helpful in management of refractory ascites. I put small diameter TIPS that because it is still very effective 
in management of refractory ascites, and it decreases the possibility of, um, uh, of vertebratic encephalopathy. Next, D is defend. Uh, patients with prior SPP prophylaxis should be on lifelong antibiotics or until transplant. Uh, prophylaxis during GI bleed with uh, ceftriaxone, not only does it prevent um, SBP possibility, but there is an overall mortality benefit in patients with cirrhosis. We all know that uh, during the episode of SBP, we want to give large doses of uh, albumin on day one and day three of the diagnosis to prevent development of um, uh, uh, acute kidney injury and potentially HRS. Last D is uh, immun immunization. Uh, vaccinating patients for hepatitis A and B is very intuitive. They already have one liver disease. We don't want them to be exposed to another one. Uh, pneumonia, influenza, and certainly the latest comer to the vaccination um, arena is COVID-19. So now we're going to talk about the other side of uh, A, uh, such as renal dysfunction. So first of all, not all AKI uh, is hepatorenal syndrome. Cirrhotic patients are entitled to develop pre-renal, infrarenal, as well as post-renal causes. So the approach is just like you gen to your general medicine patient, let's make sure that we've rolled out all the alternatives. We should certainly hold the diuretics. We should try to identify and treat the underlying cause, you know, SVP being one of the more common ones. I'm a huge fan of using urinary sodium. Urinary sodium is inexpensive, it's easy to get, and it at least points you in the right direction. If you get the urine sodium and urine sodium is less than 10, you are going to be in the camp of pre-renal and possibly hepatorenal syndrome. What we'll do to differentiate between the two, we'll give an albumin challenge. Albumin challenge is one gram per kilogram of 25% albumin for 48 hours. If your urine sodium is increased, this is great news. This is not hepatorenal syndrome. You can sit back and relax. You fix the problem. If your urine sodium is unchanged, you are more likely dealing with a hepatorenal syndrome, and we'll talk about that later. So if you are dealing with a hepatorenal syndrome, you are all familiar with a mitodrine, albumin, and octreotide combination. And I'm sure you are all familiar with a miserable response rate, frequent recurrence, and we really don't know how long this patient should be treated and how do we discharge them? This is an awkward regimen to discharge a patient home to. So is there something new? There is indeed something new. There is a, a, a combination of terolipressin with albumin. Terolipressin, as you probably well know, is a synthetic vasopressin analog. And uh, it, it is... Um, its efficacy has been uh, proven via confirmed trial. Confirmed trial had about 300 patients and they were very sick. Uh, median MELD score was 33, creatinine was three and a half, and 61% of those patients were child PUC. So a very sick patient population. What we found is uh, that um, in uh, the confirmed trial, 29% of patients achieved HRS reversal, which was defined of achieving creatinine of less than 1.5 versus only 15.8% on patients who were in the placebo arm. More importantly, certainly for me, was the durability of, res of the response at 30 days. So 31.7% of patients had that durable response versus again, 15.8% in the placebo group. So this is something that is reassuring and hopefully uh, many of you already have access uh, to terlipressin in your hospital and uh, hopefully many of you will have it in the near future. HRS, the terlipressin is not for everyone. If your patient is pretty far gone with a creatinine of greater than five, if their oxygenation is the problem, if they have a, ver a very high MELD score or ACLF grade three um, uh, failure, terlipressin is not for them, uh, volume overload as well. So we should really, you know, again, take a step back and consider whether or not introducing a, a more palliative approach and potentially transition to um, hospice may be appropriate in the situation. So this is now one of the uh, ticklers, one of the future ideas. We'll focus a little bit on albumin. We all know that liver makes albumin, it has a long half-life, 
It is comprises the majority of our circulating proteins, and it's very important for oncotic pressure. Uh, basically, this is what keeps the um, the fluid the in our veins. But what is interesting that albumin has a number of non-oncotic properties. It binds molecules and drugs. It uh, um, influences inflammatory mediators. It is involved in immune response, and it is involved in the endothelial function. So here we have a very nice, uh, healthy albumin molecule in a healthy patient. We've already talked about the, its role in um, regulating fluid distribution. And we've already mentioned the non-encoding properties, such as uh, uh, binding many of the endogenous and exogenous compounds, including drugs, antioxidant, free radical, and metal ion scavenging activity, uh, and a number of other inflammatory, um, uh, immune and inflammatory um, features. So this is in a healthy individual. What about in the patient with the decompensated cirrhosis? The albumin is not healthy looking. It has major structural damage, oxidation, um, uh, NNC terminal truncation, uh, dimerization. So this is a very unhealthy looking protein. Uh, additionally, you have a problem with reduced synthesis. You have an increased catabolic state uh, and you have increased loss to the transcapillary rate. Uh, so you have albumin that is uh, poorly made, that is not enough of, and it certainly has multiple impaired functions. So it begs the question, if um, this is such an important thing and it's so compromised in patients with advanced liver disease, would long-term albumin help? So we have two major trials. One is an ANSWER trial. An ANSWER trial um, told us, yes, it does help. It led to a 38% reduction in hazard ratio for mortality. Then it was followed by the MACH trial, which told us, no, not so much. So yeah, I can spend the whole lecture just throwing about talking about the ANSWER and the MACH trial, but neither one of those trials was problem-free. So likely there is a strong benefit to albumin administration and likely it will become a part of the universal guideline for management of patients with decompensated disease. It will likely need a long-term administration, which was a problem with the mock trial. And likely you need to achieve a pretty healthy goal of the albumin of probably uh, four grams per deciliter. So hopefully this is uh, something that will become more common um, in the uh, not so many years to come. Next, we're gonna move to B. Uh, B is for bleeding and beta blockers. So let's look at the liver here, right? We have a cirrhotic liver, which has increased resistance. Increased resistance leads to portal hypertension. Portal hypertension leads to the compensatory splanking vasodilation. The body goes, wait a minute, we don't seem to have enough blood in the system. Uh, we are seeming to, seeming to have a decreased effect of arterial circulation. That activates, um, the neurohormonal system, uh, which lead to sodium and water retention, which leads to hypervolemia and ascites. It also leads to increased cardiac output, which further pumps up uh, portal flow, which further leads to increased resistance and portal hypertension. So it is really a vicious cycle. And uh, when we look at our previous treatment with a traditional non-selective beta blockers, such as your propranolol, propranolol has beta-2 activity, which helps with the splanking vasodilation and has beta-1 activity, which helps with the increased cardiac output. But when we look at carvedilol, in addition to beta-1 and beta-2 activity, we also have alpha-1 activity. And what alpha-1 activity um, allows the liver to do is to relax. So when the liver relaxes, we have decreased resistance and we're actually attacking the problem with portal hypertension uh, and its origin. So really, you know, carvedilol uh, is the drug of choice for patients with portal hypertension. And there has been more and more data uh, uh, to start the beta blocker way earlier, not waiting for that index bleed, but to start earlier with the goal of prevention of uh, progression of liver disease. And uh, it's been most elegantly demonstrated that starting a beta blocker earlier on an the carvedilol earlier in the disease process prevents the development of ascites. So we've already talked about this. Uh, next B is for breathing. 
right? Lots of things can go wrong with breathing in patients with uh, advanced liver disease. You can have pneumonia, you can have hepatic hydrothorax, you can develop hepatopulmonary syndrome or portopulmonary hypertension. Today, I'm going to focus on hepatopulmonary syndrome. So uh, what causes it? It is, uh, um, HPS is called by intrapulmonary vasodilation or IPVD. It is most commonly seen in cirrhotics. In fact, patients who are undergoing liver transplantation, a vast majority um, have documented intrapulmonary vasodilation by echocardiogram. It can be seen in prehepatic portal hypertension as well as in acute or chronic hepatitis. Severe liver impairment is actually not necessary and it does not correlate to the severe liver impairment. Manifestation, I think many of them you know, dyspnea is the most common symptoms, platypnea, which is shortness of breath that is exacerbated by sitting up and improved by lying supine, orthodeoxia, it's the hypoxemia that exacerbated in a prior position, tachypnea, polypnea, which is uh, defined as rapid or panting respiration, and clubbing. So pay attention the next time you see a patient. And when you see clubbing, you might want to ask yourself, is this patient potentially at risk for HPS? So what happens at HPS? Why um, intrapulmonary vas vasodilation is so important? So here we look at the uh, healthy patient. This is your alveolus. This is your vessel. Um, in the normal uh, situation, the deoxygenated blood comes in, it comes in close contact with the um, uh, alveolus, and it comes out very nicely ox oxygenated. When these vessels become dilated, not all the blood is uh, being able to come closely um, in contact with the alveolus, and therefore the oxygenation is impaired, and this uh, creates a physiologic shunting. So that is really the pathophysiology of HPS. But the question is, you know, why does this happen? Like, what is the driving force behind it? And this is a very complex diagram. So we'll uh, kind of take it one step at a time. So here we have a cirrhotic liver. It developed porter, it um, resulted in development of porter hypertension. Porter hypertension drives the increased release of uh, endothelin one. Endothelin one eventually leads to the increased expression um, and activity of uh, one of the um, nitrous oxide uh, synthetase, ENOS, that causes more nitrous oxide and that causes vasodilation. So that's one avenue for that to happen. The other avenue, you remember about the systemic inflammation, bacterial translocation, um, and uh, the uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So we meet them again over here. This leads to the recruitment of microphages in the lungs. Microphages uh, increase expression and activity of another uh, nitrous oxide synthetase, INOS. And that, again, leads to more nitrous oxide, more vasodilation. Is that it? Not quite. So those microphages um, actually cause chaos in the lungs. The more microphages uh, causing more, um, they're becoming more adherent. Uh, to the endothelial cells. This has caused endothelial cells proliferation, angiogenesis, and that further, further contributes to the development of a hepatopulmonary syndrome. So a very complex pathophysiology here. So how do we diagnose it? So it, the diagnostic criteria includes hypoxia with a PO2 of less than 80 or AA gradient of um, greater than or equal to 15. We give it up to 20 in older patients. Really, if you're seeing a patient um, uh, with an oxygen saturation below 96%, you should at least consider HPS. So how do we, we can certainly suspect, but how do we actually diagnose it? So the diagnosis is really cool because uh, it really ties together to the pathophysiology of the problem. So what we do is uh, we use a conscious enhanced uh, TT. And basically what that means, we inject uh, micro bubbles. So bubbles that are uh, greater than 10 micrometers in diameter. Uh, into the systemic circulation. And then uh, we wait for three to six cycles and to see if uh, the bubbles appear in the left heart chamber. So the reason this works so well is because uh, this size of the bubbles does not pass through the normal circulation, but it does pass 
through those uh, uh for those dilated vessels. So the, if microbubbles are able to pass through the dilated vessel, they're gonna show up in your left heart. And this is uh, essentially diagnostic, diagnostic for um, HPS. So can we fine tune the diagnosis? So we can certainly do the TEE to make sure that you don't have a, a intracardiac shunt. Uh, next, you can consider the use of the uh, technetium labeled microaggregated albumin. So now we're looking at the particles that are somewhere 20 to 50 micrometers, right? Again, the same concept that these particles can pass through the abnormal pulmonary capillaries and they can uh, lodge in the downstream capillary beds in the brain, kidneys, and the spleen. So why do we need that? Why is that important? Well, a couple of reasons. So there's two clinical scenarios in which this is going to become helpful. One, if you have a, a suspicion for HPS and you have an intrinsic lung disease, if your shunt function is greater than 6%, then you can be pretty confident that HPS is playing uh, at least a decent role in uh, your patient's respiratory problems. The other thing is uh, in your patients with a low PaO2 below 50 and a large shunt function greater than 20%, um, this, is an this is associated with the poor liver transplant outcomes. So right as I was uh, getting ready to jump on the webinar, I was talking to Dr. Kumari from Stanford, and she shared with me that they recently transplanted two patients with severe HPS with a shunt fraction, not just greater than 20%, but greater than 35%. And they used uh, intraoperative nitrous oxide. Both patients have done really well. So I think there's hope. Management is really not interesting. There's nothing that works. Really, the only thing that works is a long-term oxygen therapy. And we all like to believe that our patients look like that when they're in long-term term oxygen therapy, but in reality, they really look more like this. So in your patients with HPS, we should uh, certainly strongly considered re expedited referral for transplant evaluation, or alternatively, begin discussions of goals of care. Um, management, uh, liver transplant is really remarkable for this patient. Uh, greater than 85% of patients improve, and they have an 88% of five-year survival. So patients with uh, PAO2 of less than 60 should be evaluated for liver transplant. They may qualify for MELD exception points, and it's going to get them to where they're going faster. Um, the lower the PAO2 goes, it is still associated with increased post-liver uh, uh, transplant mortality. So we should really keep an eye on uh, PAO2 with the every six months ABGs in order to facilitate prioritization. Next, uh, we're going to move to C. C is for cancer. This is very easy. Uh, all patients with cirrhosis uh, are at risk for liver cancer, as well as patients with hepatitis B, as well as uh, a subset of patients with NASH who are at risk for HCC, even outside of the presence of cirrhosis. So we're going to briefly talk about diagnosis. Uh, so all of the hepatologists will obsessively ask for a uh, triphasic or some in some institution we call it quad, quad phasing imaging. Why is that? Why can we just not, not rely on like a regular EDCT? Well, the reason for that uh, is that we need to uh, uh, get to the major diagnostic criteria. And those include arterial phase hyperenhancement, delayed phase washout, pseudocapsule, and interval growth. That was a mouthful, and I promise it will become clearer in the next slide. So back to the pathophysiology of the liver, right? You remember that liver has dual blood supply. The vast majority of the blood supply comes from the portal venous circulation, um, and uh, you know the remainder of it comes from the arterial circulation. This is not the case with the tumor. The tumor primarily drinks the arterial blood. So in your triphasic imaging, in the arterial phase, the tumor will become bright because it's now drinking um, the arterial blood, while the rest of the liver will be dark. In the portal venous phase, the situation will be reversed because now the liver is drinking the blood and the tumor is not. So this is your arterial phase hyperenhancement and venous washout. This on this slide, you have a pseudocapsule. Uh, which is sometimes makes it look a little bit like an abscess, and this is the third major diagnostic criteria. So uh, LIRADS-1 is definitely a benign lesion. LIRADS-5, definite cancer. How do we get there? 
So this is uh, one way to get there, um, one of the many algorithms that uh, radiologists would use. So over here on this side, we have our three major diagnostic criteria, washout capsule threshold growth. Over here, we have arterial phase, um, hypo, hyper, or iso enhancement. And down here, we have a size, right? So let's say you're seeing a patient uh, who has a lesion that has washout and it has met the threshold growth, cri growth criteria. So you're already in the two major diagnostic criteria. Let's say your patient has arterial phase hyperenhancement. And let's say your patient has a large tumor. So this leads, um, lends us squarely into the LIRADS-5 category. <clears throat> Uh, is biopsy necessary? Uh, generally not. If this is the uh, appropriate clinical scenario, patient has cirrhosis, uh, this diagnosis, diagnosis is radiologic. Moving next to diuretics, we've already talked extensively about uh, uh, the ratio being a myth. Please do not start your patients prophylactically on diuretics. You know, diuretics do not fix anything. They are only there to take care of the problem. Or of course, we would hold them if the patient is sick. And uh, dosing diuretics once a day helps your patient get a good night rest instead of running to the bathroom. E for encephalopathy. Encephalopathy is associated with poor prognosis. In a study of about 100 patients for about a year, following their first episode of avert hepatic encephalopathy, 74% of them died during the follow-up period. There's a 23% survival rate in three years. Again, this is way, way worse than um, uh, in uh, many cancers. Now we're going to talk about the four R's of hepatic encephalopathy, risk assessment, recognition, reversal, and rifaximin. Okay. Risk assessment. So you all know that uh, patients with cirrhosis you know, may develop hepatic encephalopathy. It's important to keep in mind that patients with severe acute liver injury, such as Tylenol overdose, acute hepatitis, or drug-induced uh, liver injury, may also develop hepatic encephalopathy. And again, it's a poor prognostic sign and time to revise strategy. What brings it on? I know you know all of this. GI bleed, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, medications, dehydration, electron imbalance, constipation, other infections if the patients don't only develop SVP. Portal vein thrombosis, we oftentimes forget about that one, so don't forget to order a Doppler. Recognition, right? So um, ammonia, in my mind, is evil. Ammonia levels should never be checked, certainly never, ever on the outpatient, probably never, ever on the wards. And the only really use for the ammonia checks in patients who are intubated, who are in the ICU and are unable to participate in the examination. Asterixis is great. You should uh, know how to do the asterixis, uh, teach your learners, and teach the family. And this is a much better test than uh, uh, using the um, ammonia test. The other one that I really like is, check hand, is checking handwriting. This is, again, something you can teach the family, or you can even keep the clipboard on patient's bedside in the hospital. And you'll see how the handwriting improves or worsens with the uh, treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. Next is reversal. You got to be quick about it. Uh, and you bet you were gonna thinking I was going to say lactulose. Uh, lactulose has its role, but what we've recently seen that using polyethylene glycol or PEG results in more rapid HE resolution in the first 24 hours and which all of our hospitals love shorter length of stay. So this is definitely something that I reach for a lot more frequently. Lactulose, you're all familiar with. And a couple other things to mention, NG2 tube insertion is encouraged. Uh, you cannot poke the varices with an NG tube. Uh, the only limitation is the patient is freshly banded within 48 hours. Okay, uh, moving on. Rifaximin uh, is an oral minimally absorbed antibiotics. It does not enter bloodstream. It has no clinical drug-drug interactions and no dosing adjustment are needed for renal or liver dysfunction. Right now, it's a proof of reduction in risk of avert hepatic encephalopathy recurrence. And there's certainly a lot of um, studies that are ongoing that look at the potential influence of uh, rifaximin uh, earlier in the disease that may potentially prevent not only development of avert hepatic encephalopathy, but progression of liver disease in general. 
This is an older study from 2010 that really showed us that uh, uh, com uh, adding rifaximin to management of lactulose uh, results in a significant uh, separation of curves uh, in terms of the breakthrough episode of hepatic encephalopathy. That was the primary endpoint of the study. And the secondary endpoint is time to uh, first HE-related hospitalization. Again, nice separation of curves. The message here, this is not a stepwise approach. We did not start lactulose first, let, a lot, let the patient fail, and then reach for rifaximin. If your patient has overt hepatic encephalopathy, uh, they should be on both medications from the get-go. Uh, getting close to the end of it, F is for addiction uh, assessment and treatment. And uh, I want to share with you an app that my patient recently taught me. This is called Everything AA. And it's a wonderful app. Patients can schedule meetings, attend meetings, do the readings, uh, even listen to our recorded podcasts. So this is something I uh, share with all of my patients. G is for goals of care. And then goals of care, are, to me, is kind of twofold. Uh, first of all, transplant and palliative care are not mutually exclusive, and it's important for patients and families to understand that. So in the goals of care, I look, I, I want to evaluate whether or not patient is a tra potential transplant candidate. Do they have the right ducks in a row uh, to be a successful candidate, or is it time to really discuss um, uh, goals of care and potential uh, focus on um, comfort? Last but not least, I'm going to talk briefly about ACLF. And uh, ACLF can be intimidating, but basically all it means is your patients with cirrhosis have developed a new and acute decompensation, such as worsening ascites, HE, uh, bleeding, jaundice, uh, or bacterial infections such as SBP. And it is uh, associated with one or multiple organ failures. Precipitants can be ongoing drinking, hepatitis, such as hepatitis B, reactivation, drug-induced liver injury. This is kind of lumped as hepatic causes and non-hepatic causes such as bleeding, infection, surgery, whatnot. Uh, there are ACLF grades anywhere from no ACLF to grade three. And this is basically the more organ failures you have, the higher your ACLF grade is. Fortunately, we have a um, ACLF calculator. Uh, that helps us understand how sick are our patients and what is their prognosis. So you're going to input uh, Billy creatinine, uh, West Haven grade for HE, um, INR, uh, your circulatory score, your breathing score, and then the um, your iPhone is going to tell you um, uh, ACLF grade, which in this case is going to be grade three, and it's going to give you a score. Uh, probability of dying at 12 months, 86%. At six months, 82%. At three months, 79%. So this is really a very useful tool uh, for talking to patients um, who are very sick, who are in the ICU. So really, um, ACLF is, uh, again, we can talk the entire day about it, but the message, the take-home message is patients who develop ACLF need to be referred and evaluate in an expedited fashion. Conversely, withdrawal of ongoing care uh, in the after the intensive care support has been rendered and patients are not considered for candidates for liver transplant. If they have four more organ failures after about a week of adequate ICU therapy, you should really talk about withdrawal of aggressive care. Last H is for hold, just scan your patient's medication list. They are on all kinds of interesting medication, opioids, benzos, lactulose, and rifaximin. As much as I love them, they do not work prophylactically at this point. Beta blockers, you know, we are starting to uh, edge earlier and earlier into the disease to start them. Prophylactic diuretics do not work. NSAIDs are very bad for patients. And Tylenol is actually the safest medication for management of pain. Uh, or fever as long as it's used in under two grams a day. So ABCs, ascites, um, and renal dysfunction. We're hoping uh, that albumin will uh, um, help us uh, manage this patient in the future. B for bleeding and breathing. We've talked about the increasing use of uh, carvedilol. We learned a little bit about diagnosis and management of HPS. C for cancer circulation. D for diuretics. 
um, E for encephalopathy, F for fun, G for goals of care, um, and H for holding inappropriate medications. And that's how you handle liver. Dr. Roy, that was uh, <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. Um, it's probably the best use of the ABCs um, that I've come across it, and you know, to for you to squeeze all of that, uh, you know, even including one of my favorite pathophysiology, um, the pulmonary syndrome, is, is really impressive and, and really helpful for the fellows. On um, some of the questions um, um, that we have were. You know, if we mentioned beta blocker a lot, and I think, I think for most of us, what we were taught is propanolol, um, and given the panel of dosing as well as the heart rate monitoring, and you mentioned carbanolol as being sort of the kind of the, 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 the primary beta blocker that we should be using. Um, is there a dosage or a, a, a type of your, basically, they're interested in hearing your practice in terms of the dose that you start off, and what is the goal? Absolutely. So propanolol, we're kind of used to be we're trained to target it to a certain heart rate, right? And we also know that most of the studies with propranolol use massive doses of propranolol, right? Their patients are like on 80 and 160 milligrams of propranolol. And uh, I bet you none of you has ever gotten even close to that kind of dosing of propranolol. So fortunately uh, with Coreg, uh, or carvedilol, there is one is number one is not a specific heart rate target. And you really can start very low. I start at 3.125 for the most part. And uh, I just titrate up slowly as the patients tolerate it. So it's a more user-friendly and a more realistic drug to get us to where we want to go. Awesome. And then the, for you mentioned, you know, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and how secondary prophylaxis as well as primary prophylaxis to the setting of a GI bleed. But for the other criteria is for primary prophylaxis, including like the you know, BUN, total bilirubin, as well as a child PU score. Uh, one question is when you when these patients meet these criteria based on the ASO guidelines, and when they get better and they recompensate, do you start pulling some of the primary prophylaxis off? So that's a really great question. And I think uh, primary prophylaxis is not as straightforward as we think. If you actually read the ASLD guidelines carefully, it says that primary prophylaxis may be considered. Um, so it's actually not like you should go ahead and absolutely do it on everyone. And the reason for that is this recommendation is based on an older study. It's, I'm gonna say it's at least uh, 10, 15 years old. It's a small study that looked at about 60 patients uh, that used, um, uh, that set up this weird criteria that you're describing. And we have all been basing our primary prophylaxis on the smaller studies that has been done a long time ago. You know, there's a whole other flip side to using primary prophylaxis on somebody for years and years to come, right? You know, antibiotic resistance, potential for fungal infection, all kinds of things. So I am very cautious in my practice of just uh, using primary prophylaxis for, you know, relatively no good reason. If your patient is paracentesis dependent, absolutely. I think this is a great reason to use primary prophylaxis. For everybody else, it's really more of an individualized measure. Um, measure. And certainly if the patients recompensate, I'll be the first one to pull them off of their primary prophylaxis. Awesome. And then, you know, I loved all the pearls that you created or you, you provided us. And for the fellows on, you know, sometimes we get consulted for, you know, AKI and the interns or the medicine hospitalists, they automatically consume this HRS and we should be getting transplant center. But one thing is just if the patient doesn't have ascites, it's a very, very low chance that they have HRS. Um, so I love the sodium, the green sodium that you, you the, that that pearl is, is so is so clutch. Um, and then for, um, one thing you brought up was the tips. Um, you know, I think I can just talk briefly about when to consider early tips or do you, you know, I think the United States is not as on board as the European colleagues where the preemptive tips. Um, but so what's your practice at UCSF Fresno? So certainly um, over years of my personal practice, uh, I have been more and more liberal with the use of tips earlier and earlier in disease process. And uh, certainly the results that I've seen in a carefully selected patients have been remarkable. I think one of the students or residents in this on the call today saw a patient with me in clinic today 
who have done just remarkably. She went from uh, massive ascites, intractable ascites, sarcopenia, uh, to the point that her family is trying to put her on a diet because she's gained too much weight. So really, it's a, it's a remarkable tool in a carefully selected group of patients, right? So certainly lower MELT score, you know, under 20, ideally maybe under 18. Um, this is one criteria. Ideally, they do not have um, pre-existing hepatic encephalopathy. Ideally, they're not so malnourished that they're just skin and bones because muscle plays an active role in um, toxin metabolism, including the ammonia. So putting the tips into somebody who's act, who's malnourished is, you know, largely a recipe for, you know, intractable hepatic encephalopathy, but it works amazing in a selected group of patients. So I completely agree. I think we don't tips early enough and I don't think we tips enough. Um, okay. You mentioned sarcopenia, which is a, you know, dear and dear passion to, of, of, of me, but for the fellows, I'm making sure, you know, there's one thing that was mentioned briefly was frailty and, and the importance of nutrition. So, you know, our, our patients with cirrhosis is a catabolic state. So making sure to get, you know, 30 to 30, up to even 40 K cows per kilogram per day, as well as that 1.2 to 1.5 grams of um, per kilogram per day of protein. And also the night nighttime snacks, guys, can really help them, especially in hepatic encephalopathy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And remember, you do not need to severely restrict their sodium. They're not in heart failure uh, and that yeah. will help them to eat. And then the last, the, the last slide that you brought up, I think is we had another talk earlier today, earlier this year was um, Dr. Patel from UCLA. And the last thing I just wanted to go, kind of let the fellows on is, you know, it's never too early or never too, yeah, it's never too early to get palliative care on board, um, just to kind of assist our patients as well as their family members going through this tough time. Um, so I think yeah, and I just want to mention one last thing. There was yeah. a talk that I went to by uh, Dr. Marina Serper from uh, um, UPenn. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was really interesting is uh, we always think that the patients are afraid of palliative care. They think they're associated with like the death and giving up. And that's actually not the case. The study that they've done and they've looked Patients are actually very open to talking about their feelings and their end of, you know, planning for end of life care. So do not be afraid of the path of care involvement. Agree, especially with that staggering mortality rate that you had for three years in society. Exactly. Um, so um, for the fellows on, any other last questions while we have Dr. Reutemann's attention? Well, um, without further ado, we start ending our last on our hour now. And I'm um, just again, just want to appreciate all the fellows for attending and taking time of your busy schedule, especially Dr. Reutemann for um, teaching us this amazing, um, <laughs> uh, amazing pearls in terms of how to manage our cirrhotic patients. Thank you, Niam, and thank you, everyone. Have a good night, you guys. Right, good night, everyone.